Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am here again at the Palm Springs Air Museum. We're going through the collection. We, Greg, we had a, a fun thing that we went through. We did all the trainers in the inventory. We're kind of moving out of trainers now. And Greg today is my insouciant assistant. He, uh, he keeps getting more and more words. The question is, how many syllables is he going to throw at me anymore? The other thing is, you know when you agree to do something and you really never understand the unintended consequences of doing that? Well, here are the unintended consequences. This, of course, is a nautical theme. I am not going to deal with any of the jokes from this hat. I'm not going there, Greg. I am not going there. But today, obviously, we're on a nautical theme. We're getting into the fighters. We're going to start with one of the very, very early fighters in the 1950s, and we're going to talk about the F9F Panther. I'm going to remove my crab hat, and I'm going to toss it to Greg. Oh, there you go. He got it. I'm going to toss it off camera there. Now, the F9F Panther is interesting, and why is it interesting? I'm going to tell you, Greg, and that is what it was is it is one of those transitional fighters. We've talked about that before. Remember, we just finished up the T-33, which is a derivative of the P-80. Well, this airplane here is another airplane coming out of first flight was in 1947, and it, but it was coming out of the war. It is still, like we talked about with the T-33 or the P-80, we're still dealing with a lot of World War II technology. So the Grumman designers are trying to give themselves a couple of different engine options for the airplane, the J-33 and the J-48. The J-48 engine was a derivative of the British engine, the RB-44. Now the British at that time were way ahead on jet engine technology. So, and we have to remember that the British licensing a Ru the Russians, a version of one of their early jet engines, is what the Russians used to reverse engineer the jet engine that went in the MiG, the MiG-15, which was a complete game changer. As we talked about with the P-80 last week, this airplane, uh, primarily World War II technology, but with this straight wing and a little bit lower thrust. you got to remember, and we'll talk about why Navy airplanes are a little bit heavier, but this airplane... Uh, was in the same performance envelope. We're talking about a jet engine that generates about 5,000 pounds of thrust, give or take. Uh, you could water inject these engines and get a little bit more power out of them. But the, uh, and Greg, you know what we should do is we should see if we can actually find a graphic about water injection into these jet engines. I'm going to let Greg go out and hunt for that. If he has it, we'll throw it up. But these aircraft, now Navy airplanes are a little bit different in that, what do they do, Greg? They land on that flight deck. So when they land on the flight deck, you got to remember that Navy airplanes are a little bit more robust. That is not being critical of the uh, Air Force airplanes versus the Navy airplanes, but the realization is when a, one of these airplanes lands on a carrier deck, it's literally a controlled crash. So they, they have their tail hook and they have to land, and what they have to do is they, um, they come to a stop very quickly. Now, in the early days, you got to remember, these were non-afterburning engines, and they had a problem. All these early jet engines had power management issues. This airplane is no different. So if you wanted to say that these jets were underpowered, that's a fair statement to make on these jets. They were not very responsive. In fact, uh, I've heard one of these pilots, I didn't use it last week, but I'll use it this week. You could push the throttle forward and then go and call your mother and come back and wait for the jet to actually react. They were very slow on power, even more so with carrier airplanes. Now this particular aircraft had a similar design genesis uh, in the P-80 in that, remember the P-80 was a derivative of the uh, P-59, or not a derivative, but was basically an outgrowth with the P-59 being a technology demonstrator. In this case, uh, this airplane started out as the G 79 designation, and it was up against an airplane, Greg, called the Sky Knight. The Sky Knight was very similar, that was a Douglas aircraft, aircraft, very similar in a sense that 
what we were dealing with generationally is airplanes were changing so rapidly that we were basically dealing with something that would prove technology and then eventually we'd get through the technology and we would move on to another airplane. We went through in the early 50s probably five or six different generations of airplanes uh, in a very short period of time as airframes changed and as jet engines changed. So this was really kind of the Navy's first workable um, jet fighter interceptor. It was not, they made about 1,400 of them. It was not uh, anything to write home about. It had uh, four 20 millimeter cannons. It could be fitted with rockets on the wings. It had reasonable range, similar issue. They're all thirsty. So they were, if I'm gonna step out of frame here and make Greg work a little bit. They all were fitted with these wing tanks. By the way, these wing tanks on this airplane actually approved its, improved its roll rate a little bit. So they actually were a bit of a design improvement. Now this airplane grew in to another aircraft and that was the Cougar. Now the Cougar was actually in the design uh, structure, was the design 93 and this airplane evolved into the Cougar. Now the Cougar, <coughs> excuse me, the Cougar had swept wings and we're starting to get into swept wing technology as we incorporate what we've learned, the United States has learned, and all of that uh, technology that we inherited on uh, swept wing design from the Germans. And these airplanes benefited uh, from that and later generations in the airplanes benefited. Now Greg, if you can get a shot of the nose of that airplane, this aircraft is a little bit different. And why is that, Greg? Well, look at that, and you could see it. There's no guns on this airplane, right? We, there's no guns. So what ends up happening here is this is, normally there'd be 20 millimeter cannons up front. Now remember, we've gone away from 50 caliber machine guns, we've gone to cannons. A little bit slower rate of fire, uh, a little bit less ammunition on board, but a much bigger punch similar to what happened with the MiG going with uh, larger cannon rounds. The Air Force, like with the F-86, was still sticking with uh, 50 caliber machine guns, but this airplane had cannons. Now, look at that, Greg, what is that? That is a camera. And what is this airplane designed to do? This is a reconnaissance airplane. This is an F-9F-5P. This was, there were two P, and 2P or not 2P, Greg? That is the question. I just threw that in there. I do not know, Greg, what happened. Greg is rolling his eyes. I just jumped into that. But we'll throw a joke in, Greg. Although I'm not, the crab thing was probably as close to a joke as we're going to get. But this uh, aircraft had a camera in it. Now, the 5P version of this airplane had a longer nose and, and, the, uh, and was specifically designed for that. Now the interesting thing on the markings on this airplane is this aircraft is actually in the markings that we were able to find when it flew off the Oriskany. So it is actually, uh, what we try to do with every one of these airplanes, and we've talked about this before, is tie them back to very specific, uh, historically accurate markings and tie them back to docents or people. This particular airplane uh, was a marine aircraft uh, these aircraft were, they came in, the first flight was in 1947. They were pretty much out of the picture by the late 50s. They had been completely surpassed and they were pretty much retired with the exception of the, a few of them by the early 1960s. They were completely done because from a performance class, remember, they were subsonic. They were very thirsty on fuel and there were airplanes within a span of about five years Look at the, uh, and Greg, uh, airplane we just did on under the cowling, the F-105. And compared to this airplane, this is um, a really slow airplane compared to that F-105. So Greg can get a long shot down the side of the airplane and give you a better idea of the markings. Navy aircraft at that time were really, really colorfully, colorfully marked. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do what I normally do, and that is pick up this model of this pretty airplane. I'm going to give you the plan view right there. This is the Panther. Now all Navy aircraft at that time were really highly marked. You see a lot of Navy airplanes now 
we've gotten to that low vis, the low visibility gray. And there's a lot of reasons for that. They're easy to maintain the, as what they say, they're low visibility. And in some cases, some of those coatings actually absorb some radar, make them a little bit harder to see on electronics. But back in the day, this was pretty much as close as it got. Now you could see very good visibility on the aircraft, the 20 millimeter cannons, you have the two breathers. There is a tail hook that was on this airplane. The wing design on this airplane, you gotta remember these um, Navy airplanes were coming aboard at fairly low speed on aircraft carriers. So you have a, a thicker wing on this airplane and a little bit bigger wing design. Remember they weren't as proficient as they are now with flaps and spoilers about changing the wing design on the airplane. The other thing was, remember, when this airplane with this engine, we talked about not a, a huge amount of thrust, about 5,000 pounds of thrust, so you didn't have a ton of power in these airplanes. Now, this aircraft versus the MiG-15 was a disappointment. Um, the very, very low kill numbers in uh, Korea, aerial victories, it did not do well, primarily for all the reasons that we've talked about before. You did have... Uh, this was still a gun sight uh, airplane. You know, there were there were no uh, missiles on this airplane, air-to-air -air missiles or anything like that. So you were going to guns. It did have ground rockets on it. But the, uh, the airplane just, none of these early straight-wing airplanes really measured up against that MiG. The MiG was a game changer. And we talked, we're going to do the F-86. The F-86 was really the airplane that changed it. The other edge that we had in uh, Korea was the pilots in this uh, in these airplanes were all uh, or not all but most of them had combat experience coming out of World War II so they were good on aerial combat now they were up against a lot of Soviet pilots that were actually flying North Korean airplanes we know that now we didn't know it at the time we suspected it and I've read a, um, a after action report one in an aerial engagement one time where the MiG pilot bailed out, and as he went by, the Air Force pilot noticed his helmet came off, and guess what? The Korean was blonde. There's not a lot of, there's nothing against blonde Koreans, but blonde Koreans are, are not very common in Korea, and he, he realized it had to have been a Russian pilot coming out of the airplane. Now, the, um, so this aircraft uh, did not really measure up in aerial combat. Now, there is a really great story about this airplane. And remember, we tie all these aircraft back to individuals. These are all people that flew this airplane or were involved in this airplane uh, in their service history. There's pilots on here. There's one guy on here, Royce Williams. Now, why is Royce Williams uh, significant? Well, he was involved in an aerial engagement off the Kamchatka Peninsula, off the Russian coast, that he could not talk about for his entire Navy career. Greg, can you believe that? And that was that he got involved with his wingmen against six MiGs. And they were actually MiGs that were flown by Soviet naval aviation pilots, and it turned into a dogfight. His airplane, when he got back to the Oriskany, had over 250 cannon holes in it. Grumman aircraft were always known, it was called the Ironworks for a reason, their airplanes were very tough. He made it back. He was involved in a winding engagement with these MiGs, uh, basically fighting for his life, and he really never knew at the time how many of the, he engaged the airplanes, but the fight was so confused that he did not know how many airplanes he got. Now, Greg, when he got back to the ship, the captain said, uh, the Admiral's going to want to see you. So he got back to Japan. They took him off an airplane. And where'd they fly him, Craig? There we go. Another nice, fine jet aviation being on the airport, taking off here. They took him back to Washington, D.C. And guess who he ended up with? He was in a conference with the President of the United States. And the President of the United States said, you cannot talk about this. This happened over the line, and this could start a war. So for his entire career and after that, the engagement was classified. After the Soviet Union fell, the, they were able to confirm that he actually shot down four MiGs in that engagement. They were flown by Soviet aviation pilots, 
And the twist on it was we knew that he had made the, uh, that he'd actually shot those airplanes down. And when the president talked to him, President Eisenhower talked to him, he knew how many airplanes and why was that, Greg? Because there was a, a national a NSA or a CIA spy ship listening to the entire engagement off the coast. They had the entire information on the shoot down, but he couldn't talk about it. If you go out and like in our archive, there are a lot of reports during the Cold War where the Cold War wasn't that cold. There were a lot of airplanes that got shot down on both sides and we didn't talk about it because at that time it could have started a war. So we weren't going to do that. But this, that in hindsight, and nobody knew it at the time, probably the F-9F's finest hour. Four MiGs in a rolling fight with this airplane, with a superior airplane. So I want to go over here and I'm going to move to my stage two because that, I'm going to have Greg follow me here. And we're going to go over here and we're going to go to my stage two and I am going to salute uh, Royce. I'm also going to salute the V-Hook conference coming up here in a couple of weeks, which is the Tailhook Association, which that's kind of exciting. And so we're going to salute that. So let's see what you did. Greg, last week, um, that was just plain nasty. Uh, this is colored. This is Stewart's Fountain Classics Black Cherry Wishniak, whatever a Wishniak is, I have no idea. Uh, naturally and artificially flavored, a rich cherry taste. Greg, made with cane sugar. You know I like cane sugar. 180 calories. There is no telltale preservative ring, which means uh, I, I don't have a, a sell by date on this, but uh, this one has 180 calories. It's got. Um, looks like 44 grams of carbs. This thing's got a lot of carbs, if I'm reading that correct. Now, as I always say, Stewart's is not a sponsor of this program. We'll go ahead and give this a shot. And so to all of you Tailhook Association members and all the guys that flew this airplane, and especially Royce, congratulations on that, those aerial victories. We salute you. You know what, Greg? After three tries, this one's not bad. This, oh, by the way, since 1924, Greg is like, okay, I got one. I, I'm going to keep this one with me, Greg. I, again, I, the rare time I get any sugar. Mm. So the other thing, now on the table here, we have a, a lot of, uh, in fact, all these artifacts were from an F9F pilot. You can actually see this in our collection. This is one of our docents, a docent by the name of McGowan. And he um, flew. He's got everything from his squadron, his flight suit, his scarf. We actually have his logbooks and his, um, all of his maps and all of his designation. Now you can see this in exhibit with this airplane, which is very, very cool. One thing, look at the helmets. You can, the helmets in the 50s on these airplanes almost look like the old style football helmets and they were all brightly colored. The Navy has kind of gone away from that from a, again going back to a low visibility but if Greg you can get a shot of that that is a really uh, that is a classic uh, cold, early early jet Cold War helmet. Now this airplane as I said was another technology mover and it kind of had to move over um, when we, when we, uh, when we kept designing new airplanes. Now, a little private history on this, Greg. We have some private history here. This particular airplane, probably since I was about 16, 17 years old, I knew where this airplane was. This airplane was sold as scrap and was hauled off by its owner. This airplane sat near a major intersection or interstate that I would go by all the time. Gradually, I, Greg, I watched the airplane kind of slowly, slowly, slowly fall into disrepair. And you know, Greg, in a couple more years, this airplane probably would have returned to the earth, as we say. It would have been beyond repair, but our restoration department got a hold of it. They even re-blew the canopy. They repaired all of it. 
and we put it back in its original markings. Having Royce come out and actually go through it and sign the airplane was real high point in the restoration. You can see that as well as all of the artifacts here. Now, if we're going to talk about our gratuitous product placement, Greg, you need one of these shirts. Greg, you need five of these shirts. Grumman, it has a logo on it, it has the cats. By the way, our museum has all of the cat. We have the entire cat collection. So all of the cats are here, and uh, you can get this great shirt. As I say many times, it will make you at least 15 miles an hour faster, and if you're wearing this shirt, you will be actually qualified to do a carrier landing should you be able to convince the Navy to actually do a carrier landing on one of their carriers. We will not, of course, endorse you, but please wear this shirt and see if they'll let you do that. But this, you got to go out to the website and get this shirt. I believe, Greg, there were eight cat aircraft designated cats, I think, and we go all the way up to the Tomcat, which is a VF-41 in VF-41 colors. So get out there and get this shirt. Now, a Fred fun fact, Greg, a Fred fun fact. Did you know that Grumman not only made airplanes, they made something else. They made fire trucks, and they also made a thing called the LLV. All of the postal trucks that you see were made by Grumman. And we're talking, I think there's 100,000 of them out there. There's a huge number of them out there. The Postal Service is actually looking at replacing them. But when you get dri driven by one of those big panel postal trucks, salute it because you are actually looking at a Top Gun postal truck, Greg. That was a postal truck made by Grumman. That's our, my fun fact for today. I hope you didn't know that. I didn't know that and started, until I started doing a little bit more additional research on this particular airplane. So come out to the museum and, uh, and see that. Remember, we, I'm going to grab my drink and uh, finish off here. I want to get you out to the website and uh, get, buy that gratuitous product placement. My name is Fred Bell. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Remember, smash that subscribe button on YouTube. Like us on Facebook. Remember, we're doing all under the cowling as well. If you get a chance, check out uh, the one we just did on with two F-105 pilots. That was very cool. And also, we need your donations. We can't restore these airplanes without your donations. Go on out to that website and make a donation if you can. We would sure appreciate it. My name is Fred Bell. Thank you very much for joining us on Warbird Wednesday. Have a great day.